Welcome everyone. We're going to be starting in just a few minutes. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sewer Park Audubon Center's Naturalist Notebook with Ed Dominguez tonight. Uh, I want to first of all thank you all for joining us. It's a wonderful evening out, outside, and you know, tempting as it might be, you all chose warblers over sunshine. So thank you for doing that. We also like to thank all of our volunteers and other supporters who helped make this possible. Folks who gave donuts, um, donations to us, we truly appreciate that. We allow to keep our programs running here, not only programs like tonight, but some of the other programs we do where we focus on different audiences, like uh, people who are suffering memory loss, veterans, and other groups that uh, traditionally we don't include in some of the outdoor programs uh, that you find around the community. So thank you all for all your variety of support and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, this is part of um, our series of Naturalist Notebook, where we dig deep into the brain of Ed Dominguez to talk about everything that's going on in the natural world. Tonight's about warblers, but we can also talk about um, geology, astronomy, um, everything from native plants to native trees uh, and the fish that are in the water. So this is just the first of our online presentations. So we hope you'll enjoy this and look for more presentations later on. We're also coming out of the pandemic and we're doing some live programs here in Sewer Park. So we're doing our owl prowls, our bat walks, uh, native plant walks, and of course, birding. So we hope you check out our menu of opportunities and stay connected with Sewer Park Audubon. And now I wanna introduce Ed Dominguez, who is our host for tonight. Uh, Ed is an outstanding naturalist. He's been with us a number of years. Uh, we lost him temporarily to the, COVID, um, to the COVID pandemic, but we're glad to bring him back to the program. Ed, if you can open up your camera and your microphone, I wanna go ahead and, and make sure everybody here is ready to connect with you and hear about all the things you have to talk about tonight. Um, the program is being recorded uh, on YouTube Live. You can always find that um, on our YouTube webpage. Just go to Sewer Park Audubon under YouTube and you'll find this program and all the other live programs that we've done. And Ed, uh, let's see, I don't hear you quite yet. So I uh, hope you're able to get in there and, and 
we can check in with you. Let's see if I can help Ed here. How are we doing, Ed? I don't quite hear you. I'm not sure if your microphone is open. Okay. All right, there we go. That's the voice I like. Hey, hey, great. Um, I'm just trying to get um, my screen. I don't see me up there, but hey, I know what I look like, so. And like I mentioned, we do want you to check out all the other programs that we do have at Sewer Park Audubon Center. If you go to our homepage, you'll find there's an icon with an adorable Douglas squirrel sitting right there in front, and that's going to give you a list of all the programs. One thing that we've done is we've reduced the number of slots on our walks, but we've increased the number of walks. So you have more opportunities to be up close and personal with the people leading walks who are typically at. Uh, we also have made sure that the programs are free and low cost. So right now, all the programs that we're doing, both online and in person, are free you know, with no charges. Um, you can make a donation if you're able to do, and we certainly um, uh, in, enjoy having the support of people in our community, but it certainly does make it so that we can uh, extend opportunities for more people to participate in our programs. So Ed, um, I'm turning over the comm to you. Uh, you should be able to, to um, control the, control the uh, PowerPoint. Thank you, Joey. Um, I don't have myself on the screen. I just have a static image, but, but for some reason I'm uh, having difficulty accessing that. And I'm gonna go ahead and do get off the screen and turn it over to you. Thank you, Joey. And thank you all for, whoop, thank you all for joining me this evening, whether if you're joining live and taking a break from the beautiful sun and weather, or whether you're watching this as a recording, thank you for joining us. And of course, the title of this uh, Naturalist Notebook is Warblers in Washington, Annual Visitors from the Tropics. So what is a warbler anyway? Well, here in North America, every spring and summer, birders and even non-birders alike love seeing all of the different birds that come up from the South Country into our area to uh, find mates, build nests, lay eggs, and raise a new generation of birds. These songbirds that come up are vireos, tanagers, flycatchers, even our uh, one migratory raptor, the osprey. But the particular group of birds that around North America people rejoice the most in our what we call warblers. This group of birds is always a favorite of all birders. Um, we delight in seeing them, we love them, and that's why tonight I thought we'd take a little time and explore this particularly favorite group of migratory songbirds. So what is a warbler anyway? Well, a warbler is a bird that warbles, and a warbler is an adjective that describes a certain type of bird song that has a melodic, bubbly, or burbly quality to it. And though not all of the R warbler species we're going to talk about tonight have quite that description, um, in general they do, and so they've been nicknamed warblers. It's a small migratory songbird. They average about five inches long, so we're not talking about a big bird here. And they have yellow on most or at least some part of their body. 
I think that's one of the reason that they're so beloved by birders as our migratory songbird group because that beautiful yellow makes people think of spring and uh, vitality and life and warblers seem to embody that. Warblers all have a distinct color facial pattern that we'll talk about tonight. You're seeing this image is a common yellow throat, which has a bright yellow throat, a black mask across the face that covers the eyes, and then a white eyebrow that extends right around the front of the head and goes over the other eye. So warblers all have distinctive facial color patterns. They have either pink legs, as does the common yellow throat, or some, the others have dark colored legs. And again, they all have a distinctive cheery song that we refer to as a warbler. So where do these warblers come from? Where do these birds uh, come? I've said, into, hinted already, they come from the south and some of our birds come from as far away as Mexico. Others come from Central America, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, uh, even as far south as Panama. And believe it or not, some journey from South America. That's right. Some of these small five inch long birds make a journey of over 4,000 miles to see us up here in North America. No wonder people are so uh, in awe of these birds and revere them so. They make a long, very hazardous flight they hope they find enough food along the way and fresh water to keep them going. They hope they don't have run into hazards. Uh, they hope they don't get eaten by something and they make this journey and they are up here right now. So we have here in Washington state, 12 species of warblers and we're going to explore each of those 12 this evening. Now, 12 might seem a lot, but think about this. If you live in the Eastern part of the United States, you have even greater warbler diversity. So there's a lot of these guys here, but oh man, there are so many more on the East Coast. And many people spend a great part of their lives trying to become proficient at all of these beautiful little birds. We're gonna talk about 12 tonight. Um, I'm going to explain to you when they arrive in our area, um, where they come from, what kind of habitats they like to, to you can find them in, uh, and what, distinctive physical markings they have. What are their field markings? And in particular, we're gonna talk about their songs because these birds all have distinctive vocalizations and they are a delight to hear. And I wanna help educate you as to when you hear them singing, what kind of birds you have. So let's start with the first of all, the orange crowned warbler. And we've got a nice picture of him here in a conifer, as you can see. He's not particularly bright yellow, kind of drab, olive green on the, the back. There are blurry olive streaks on the breast. There's a little bit of olive green and yellow at the, at the base of the tail. It has a white partial eye ring. You can see a little white line above the eye, a little white line below the eye, it, but it, the eye line doesn't completely encircle the eye. This is one of our earliest arriving warblers. This bird comes up to us in April and continues through May. So one of the first warblers I look for every year and await their arrival are the orange crowns. For some reason, they get a head start on migration and they're one of the first ones to join us. Now, although they arrive in April and May, they breed in our area in June. So right now they have uh, breeding, laying eggs and incubating those eggs. Now the sound of this the orange crown warbler is it sounds like if you had a, 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 a plastic comb and you held it up and ran your thumb down the, the, the tines of the comb. And it's a kind of a burbly sound. And let's take a listen. tends to descend in pitch at the end. We'll listen to it again. That's our orange crown warbler. Now you may be thinking, orange crown, well, where's the orange on his head? 
They do have feathers on the top of their head that they can erect. It's called pilo erection, and it's to show off for females and to warn off other males that, hey, don't get too close to me. This is my territory, and I mean business. Most of the time, that those orange feathers stay hidden. So um, what you see is kind of a, a gray, olive green bird with a yellow breast with faint stripes. But it's that beautiful song that you uh, will tend to hear most of the time. All right, another bird that arrives here in spring is the Nashville warbler. So let's take a look at the Nashville. It's a yellow bird, as you can see, has the beautiful warbler yellow, but take a look at the head. It's got a dark gray head, not completely around the head though, because notice the throat is yellow. It has a complete eye ring, unlike the orange crown, the white completely encircles the eye, and the yellow goes from the throat completely down on the breast, and the wings and the tail are also yellow. You can see on the top of the head, it has a few little kind of chestnutty brownish red feathers that like the orange crowned warbler, it can erect if it wants to send a signal to other males that you're getting too close, back off from my territory, or to call in females and say, hmm, look at my beautiful quaff. Most of the time though, that's hidden. So it's not a great field marking, but the, the, gray, the gray hood over the head, the white eye ring, and the uh, dark legs are indicative of the Nashville. He arrives in April and May also, so he's an early arriving warbler, breeds a little earlier. He kind of gets down to business finding his mate and, and breeding in May. So the Nashville warblers are hatched right now and the young fledglings are out and about. Now the Nashville warbler song is quite a bit different and it's two part, meaning there's two groups of syllables. So you'll hear a cheepa, 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 and then a very fast trill, T T T T T T T. Let's listen to the song of the Nashville warbler. Two parts, cheepa, 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 T T T T T T T T. He'll sing again for us. And most of these recordings, they'll sing three times. So let's hear one more. So the Nashville warbler, bright yellow with a dark head and a complete white eye ring. A beautiful spurring warbler arrival. Now, many people's favorite warbler is the yellow warbler. And this bird kind of redefines how brilliant is yellow because it's got a very vibrant yellow body, complete head, breast, back, all over yellow. The male has these red streaks down the breast that are very distinctive. No eye ring on the yellow warbler. It arrives a little bit later, so it arrived in May and breeds in May, so the young yellow warblers have hatched and fledged, takes a couple weeks, and they are out and about right now. Yellow warblers have a song that the mnemonic we like to use is sweet, so sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. Sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. A beautiful and very distinctive song. He'll do it again for you. Now, yellow warblers in our area, if you're in Seattle, are easy to find if you go to Marymore Park. And if you go to the dog walk area, um, yellow warblers really seem to like that vegetative area that's at uh, the outlet of uh, Lake Sammamish. So that's a great spot if you really want to see and hear yellow warblers, head over to Marymore Park. It's a pretty reliable location for these guys. And they'll be hanging out in all of the deciduous trees giving their sweet, 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 I'm so sweet song. And it is sweet. All right, one of the most common warblers that we see in our area is the yellow rumped warbler. Take a look at the yellow on this beautiful bird. It's got yellow on the crown of his head, yellow on the throat, yellow on its sides of its breast, and yellow at the base of the tail. It has a white eye ring, as you can see, and the back is on males is a beautiful kind of a steel gray blue. 
that contrasts sharply with that yellow that's all over its body. Now, we have two subspecies of yellow rump warblers in our area. One is called the Audubon's warbler, and this is an example of an Audubon you can see in the picture. It has a very bright yellow throat, but we also have a subspecies known as the myrtle warbler or the myrtle yellow rumped warbler. Its throat is white, so the birds look the same, but if the bird has a white throat, it's a myrtle. If it has a yellow throat, it's an Audubon's warbler. Now on the west coast here, the myrtle warblers tend to do their breeding a little further north. So both warblers arrive early, April, sometimes even March, particularly for the Audubons, but the myrtle race will be here for a week or two and then they continue on north. So up in British Columbia, you'll find more populations of the myrtles with their white throat. Here in our area in Washington, you'll find more of the Audubons with the yellow throat. They breed in May, so their youngsters have fledged by now, and they are finding out all about their new world in the forest and in uh, riparian or lakeside habitats. Now, West Coast individuals of our yellow rumped warbler, sometimes they don't migrate. There's a lot about migration that's still a mystery to us, how they do it. Migrate by the stars, migrate by the magnetic fields of the earth. Um, it's a complex series of navigational skills that these, these birds have, but some of them hang around all winter. At my feeders here in my house in Seattle, I always have one or two yellow rumped warblers that for whatever reason hang around and they really appreciate when I have my suet feeders out because they'll come and have suet. Warblers as a whole are not seed eaters and they're not birds that are going to show up at your feeding stations if you have them. But in the winter when food is scarce, um, the yellow rump warblers that hang around do appreciate having suet cakes and they will come and you know really feast on those suet cakes. So it's a delight for us to see them and it's good nutrition for them and helps them make it through um, the long cold winter. The yellow rump warbler has another two part song, siddle, 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 siddle. You know, it sounds to me, when I was a kid, they had these little toy whistles that were a little wooden dowel, and you had it on a string, and you would spin it around your head like this, and it would go, zzz, 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 zzz. and as kids, we delighted in that. This bird very much sounds like that. So let's take a listen. The yellow rumped warbler. fast burbles, and then a couple of syllables that are a little longer. And these birds were singing all over the place throughout May and still are into June. So our yellow wump warbler, one of the most ubiquitous of the warblers we have, and very, very striking. And if you're lucky, you may have one hang around at winter at your house if you have a suet feeder out. All right, the black-throated gray warbler. This is the warbler we have on the West Coast that has the least amount of yellow. It's mostly black and white with gray on the back and the wings. But notice that there's a little patch of yellow right in front of the eye and it's a bright yellow. So it kind of pops when you see this bird. It has a black eye line that goes right through the eye and down to the neck. Right above the eye is a white eyebrow and the crown of the bird is black. The throat is white and moves down to the sides, but right in the center of the throat, there's a black patch, which gives it its name, black-throated gray warbler. And there's uh, this particular uh, genus of warbler has some birds that in the East Coast that have different colors on their throat. So you might have blue or green throats, but here in the West, we have the black-throated gray. Both males and females have the yellow spot in front of the eye. This bird arrives in April and breeds in May. So again, the uh, black-throated gray youngsters are, are fledging right now and are out and about. And this bird has uh, a mnemonic that I like to say, eats a, eats a, eats a, pizza, pizza. That time he just said one pizza, eats a, eats a, eats a, pizza. Makes me hungry listening to them. This bird likes 
coniferous and deciduous forests, and it can be found in parklands and in neighborhoods all around our area. Distinctive song, and if you get a glimpse of them, at first it might kind of look like a black-capped chickadee because it's black and white, but it, these birds are much more slender than chickadees, which tend to be a little chunkier, a little, a little rounder shaped bird. This is a little more streamlined bird, and if you get a look at that bright yellow patch in front of the eye, you know you have a black-throated gray in your sights. Now the Townsend's Warbler. The Townsend's Warbler is a bird that likes coniferous forests. And in our region, they come through, they arrive in May, and then they don't spend much time in the lowlands. They head up to the high country following the melting snow line. So right now, a good place where you would find Townsend's Warblers is up near Snoqualmie Pass. They've already come through here in early May and they're up there right now, finding their partners in breeding because they're a little bit later, they're a June breeder and they like to sit at the tops of conifer trees. They've got a beautiful facial marking with all yellow on the side of the face and then kind of a black mask that goes around the eye with a little yellow patch right underneath the eye, a black crown on top of their head and a black throat. The, the belly is yellow and the wings have two white wing bars. So that black mask is very distinctive in this, in this warbler. And his vocalization is zeal, zeal, zeet, zeet, and the two sweet sweets tend to be ascending in pitch. So let's take a listen. Zeet, 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 zeet. Now again, you won't find this bird right now down in the Puget Lowlands, but if you head up into the mountains and you do any hiking on the trails, You'll hear this bird up in the uh, conifer forest. It'll be in the Pacific silver firs or up in the subalpine firs if you're up at Snoqualmie or Stevens Pass areas hiking. Um, they'll be singing all summer long. So it's a very common bird if you go up into the mountains in our high country or in the Olympics, they're there as well. The Townsend's Warbler. Now the Hermit Warbler is a bird that has an all yellow head. It's got a plain white body, dark gray back, black wings with two wing bars, no eye ring, just the eyes surrounded by yellow and a little bit of gray at the top of its head. The hermit warbler arrives in May and breeds in June. So right now they're breeding. They tend to like the mountains as well, but for the most part, they're a little south of us. And by that, I mean, if you go down to the Mount Rainier area, Mount St. Helens area and south, you'll find hermit warblers. They do hybridize with the Townsend's warblers, so you can get hermit Townsend's integrates, they're called, birds that have similar characteristics like a yellow head, but a faint black mask or a black mask that's not quite as striking as you have on the Townsend's. So these two species will interbreed with one another. And this guy, when you have it, see him and hear him says, z, 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 It sounds similar to the Townsend's. Has a little bit of a clear pitch. So if you're south of us visiting Mount St. Helens National Monument or Mount Rainier National Park or down towards the Columbia River, the Columbia River Gorge, the hermit warbler is a common warbler you'll see and hear down there. Not quite so much up here. The Townsends are the warblers that tend to like our area. But a hermit warbler, a very beautiful bird here in Washington. Now this bird looks different and you might be thinking, Ed, where's the yellow on this warbler? This is a very Halloweenish looking bird called the American Red Star. And it's got black all over its head, its throat, its breast, and its wing, but it's got this brilliant Halloween orange that's on the sides of its breast, down the tail, and on the secondaries, which are the feathers and the wings that are right behind the, the shoulder feathers. This bird arrives early, May, and then goes into June. Some can arrive even in late April. This bird kind of likes habitats that are wet. So if you have a uh, streamside or riverside, 
deciduous forests like black cottonwoods or aspens, um, red alders or slide alders, uh, with a lot of soggy ground, the red star really favors those areas. And he has a beautiful song, tita 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 si 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 sweep, and the last little syllable sweep is distinctive. So let's listen. The red start particularly favors areas that are a little east of the Cascade Crest. So a great place to hear and see red starts are in the Yakima Canyon, just south of Ellensburg. Um, you can see them over in Wenatchee and uh, up the Wenatchee River. Um, in the Metau Valley, they're, they're very common, particularly if you're between uh, Mazama and Twisp. Uh, in Big Valley Ranch, there's a, a lot of riparian area along the Metau River, and red starts love that moist riparian zone. And uh, they're beautiful to see. The female, which you'll see a picture of a little bit later, has beautiful yellow tail spots, and she flares those out frequently, just like the male will flare his patches in the tail. So the American red start, not quite as common here on the west side, but if you go east of the Cascade Crest, it's a warbler you want to look for. Now a warbler that's very common here in the Puget Sound area is the Wilson's warbler. And this is another, like the yellow warbler, a bird that kind of redefines, you know, how yellow and can yellow be. So this bird is all over lemon yellow with a very distinctive black cap, has pink legs, dark eyes with no eye ring, and like all warblers, you notice they all have thin bills that are perfect for picking insects, insect eggs, spiders. All warblers are very much insectivores, so their bills are designed to facilitate getting insects and snatch them. This bird is bred in May last month, so young Wilson's warblers are everywhere around, but the males are still singing regularly. In Seward Park, we have them. It's one of the most common warblers we have in the park singing along with black-throated grays. And in any of our parks, Discovery Park, uh, Woodland Park, Green Lake area, any of our parks that have lots of woods, you'll hear Wilson's warblers. And in your neighborhoods, you know, I live in the Madrona neighborhood in Seattle, and I've got Wilson's warblers in my yard regularly singing in the morning. Now, this bird, the mnemonic, if you can imagine a Cessna airplane, a small airplane coming in for a landing, and it has a hard landing and then finally smooths out. That's what this bird's vocalization sounds like. So an airplane, small plane making a, a rough landing. And that sound will be ringing out through the forest areas and parks, the Wilson's warbler. I wanna also say, I wanna give credit, all of the mnemonics that I'm using here, uh, almost all of them I got from one of our region's most fabulous birders, particularly when it comes to birding by ear, Libby Mills uh, up in the Padilla Bay Sanctuary. Uh, I've spent many summers with Libby and she is an absolute master birder. And in the winter, she goes down to Central America and South America and spends the winter looking up these warblers and recording their sounds down there and tracking their movements and seeing what areas they favor. So she is an absolute warbler lover and expert. And I owe a, a big debt of gratitude. Thank you, Libby, for helping me understand all of these bird songs of our warbler family. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the McGillivray's warbler. Looks a little bit like the Nashville warbler we saw, but the McGillivray's has the gray not only on the top of its head, but it comes down over the throat kind of like a cow, like Batman's cow, comes completely over the head. So where the Nashville had a yellow throat, the McGillivray's has the gray throat and it extends way down onto the breast. The rest of the bird is your classic warbler yellow. The eye ring is a two-parted eye ring. There's white on the top, white on the bottom, but not a complete eye ring. This bird, like so many of these warblers, arrives in May and breeds in June. 
Um, I tend to find McGilvery's warblers in uh, moister, damper areas. Some, some people find them in drier areas, but the McGilvery's I find kind of likes areas that have moist ground or water close by. Has pink legs, and this bird's uh, vocalization is a two-parted one. Chittle, 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 turtle, turtle. Let's take a listen. Two distinct sounds. So our, our McGilvery's warbler, we can see him here on the west side of the mountains, also very common on the east side of the mountains. Again, the Metau Valley, Wenatchee area, the Wenatchee River, Leavenworth, Icicle Canyon, Icicle Creek, um, Ellensburg, the Yakima River Canyon down into Yakima, McGilvery's warbler. The common yellow throat. Common because you find this bird air everywhere. And here in the Puget Sound area, anywhere there's a lot of water around, like think the Union Bay Natural Area, um, any wet areas around Seward Park, across Andrews Bay, I've heard them. They like it when there's where there's a lot of water around. And what a distinctive warbler. Look at that bright yellow throat, black that goes clear through the eyes, across the bridge of their, their uh, top of their bill around the other eye, and then a white eyebrow on top of that. So think of it as a black masked bird. This bird arrives in April, so a little earlier than some of the other warblers. Takes its time, waits to breed until May, and some of them aren't breeding till June. So some warblers get here and they find their mates right away and get down to the business of, you know, raising a new brood of warblers. Some hang around, feed, get their strength up, and then get around to choosing a partner and laying their eggs. The vocalization of the yellow throat is one of the most distinctive. It says, witchity, witchity, witchity. A very distinctive sound. And it's quite loud when you hear it. And when they pop up to give you a view, it is a delight to see that yellow with the black, and then you've got the white eyebrow. So the common yellow throat, a very delightful warbler. Now, this warbler is a little bit different looking. It's much larger than the other warblers, and it's known as a yellow-breasted chat. Yellow-breasted, I think you can see why. Again, how yellow can yellow be? Vivid yellow. When you get down past the belly area, the bird's underparts are white. It's got dark legs. The back is kind of brown. The head is gray. And notice the thicker bill on this bird than other warblers. So sometimes people wonder, is this really a warbler? But it's included in the warbler family, even though it's in its own genus. Notice the white patch just on the underside of the beak and the white above the eye. Now, yellow-breasted, yes. But what about the chat part? This bird is a chatty mimic bird. It has all kinds of vocalizations. So you'll hear whistling sounds, you'll hear hoots, you'll hear clucking sounds, and you know, you'll know you think of the old Three Stooges because you hear this nyak, 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 like Curly used to do. <laughs> this bird arrives in May, breeds in June, so it's breathing right now. And uh, let's take a listen to the many sounds of the yellow-breasted chat. This is all the same bird. So it's one of the most distinctive sounds of the warbler tribe is this guy, making all this variety of sounds, constantly varying the sound. And if you're lucky, he'll hop up on a branch like this and you can see, wow, this striking color. I was over at the uh, Leavenworth Bird Festival uh, last month and uh, chats were around of the Icicle River fish hatchery area by the, the water and Boy, you could hear them from, you know, 100 yards away, this crazy bird making all of these sounds and 
Everybody knew up. That's the yellow-breasted chat, and he is chatty. So those are 12 species of warblers. Let's talk a little bit about how you can enjoy warblers. And we have a chat here that's kind of given us the eye. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that make warblers so beloved and such a favorite of birders is that you have to work hard to, to see these guys. They come up here and they are constantly moving. They're like a bird that's just hyperactive. They re rarely sit still. They're flitting around constantly through the foliage and the trees. So if you hear warbler sounds and you kind of want to get your binoculars on one, um, if you can, or even your naked eye, relax your vision and look for twitchy, fast movement, something flitting around constantly, never sitting still. If you're lucky and it pauses long enough to pick some aphids off a leaf or get some caterpillars off a twig, get your binoculars up and get a look, but don't expect the bird to stay in your field of view long. Another challenge for warblers is that, you know, you might think with this striking yellow, which looks very tropical, that these birds would stand out like a sore thumb. It's amazing how effective that yellow is in camouflaging the bird. When they get in some deciduous trees, particularly if there's a breeze blowing through some cottonwoods or uh, uh, aspens or uh, uh, our native filbert, the beaked hazelnuts, alders, the bird becomes almost invisible. The yellow blends in with the light colored, light green or yellow undersides of these deciduous trees and shrubs, and they become very hard to see. When you do get a glimpse of it, and you see some yellow and you know you have a warbler, the things you want to key in on is, can you see the face? Because as you've seen with our 12 warblers, all of them have distinctive and individual facial markings. So does it have a mask? Does it have a full all yellow head? Does it have a cowl that covers all of the head down to the breast or a cowl with a yellow throat? If you can get a look at the eyes, does it have a complete eye ring or does it have a partial eye ring with a little white below, a little white above? Maybe no eye ring at all. Yellow-breasted chat here has those eye markings that sometimes are referred to as spectacles because it almost looks like it's wearing white, white spectacles. If you get a look at the legs, warblers either have pink legs or they have dark gray or black legs. That can help you. So those are some of the key things to look at when you get a glimpse of the warbler. They forage amidst trees and shrubs and constantly, as I said, on the move. But if you're patient, observing warblers is challenging, but when you see one, it's very rewarding. And again, I think that's why they're so beloved. When the warblers come into, into someone's area, everybody wants to get out and see them. Whether you're in New England, whether you're in the Carolina areas, whether you're in the heartland of the United States or here on the West Coast. The arrival of warblers and going out and seeing them is a, a big deal to birders. This is the female American red start, that Halloween bird we saw earlier where the male is black with bright orange. The female has a little different color scheme, kind of has a blue head, a white throat, and yellow instead of orange on the sides. And look at that tail. And the red starts frequently flash those tail colors. And you can see the bright yellow there of this female red star. Because these birds are hard to see, learning their songs is a great way to, to find them because many times you don't get a glimpse of them, even if they're only 20 feet away from you. They're staying in the foliage, but you hear that song loud and clear and you're looking, looking, looking and going, the bird must be right there. Why can't I see it? They are masters of staying concealed because They've made a rough, long journey with lots of things looking to eat them, like Cooper's hawks or falcons. So they're constantly on the move as a survival technique. If you're moving constantly, less chance that a predatory bird can snatch you and make a meal of you. So try to learn the songs of the warblers in your area. If you're here in the Puget Sound Lowlands, I would suggest, you know, 12 songs is a lot to learn, but if you can learn the orange crowned warbler, the bird that sounds like you're running your thumb down the teeth of a comb. The Wilson's warbler, the warbler that's 
like a Cessna or a Piper aircraft make a, making a hard landing, ta, 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 smoothing out like that. Those are two that you hear regularly in our low ones and are easy to learn. In forests, if you can add the black-throated gray warbler, it's a, it's, it's a pizza, or sometimes it's a, it's, it's a pizza pizza, say pizza twice, that's another good one to learn. And if you're in a wet area, listen for witchity, witchity, witchity. So I would say start off with those two, three or four warblers and build your sound vocabulary as time goes on. Those are some of the ones here in Seattle that are the most common and most distinctive. Now, our warblers are so prized because we don't get to enjoy them for long. They arrive in April, May, and June. And by uh, August, the young have fledged and all the warblers are no longer interested in demarcating their territory with birdsong. They're interested in feeding on insects and putting on a layer of fat to get ready for their long journey back south for the winter. By Labor Day, many if not most of our warblers have gone. Some of them leave as early as early August. So they're only with us for a couple of months, but while they're here, they are just a delight and a real, a real pleasure to discover. Now, as I mentioned, warblers are always up in trees flitting around. So it requires a lot of looking up for the trees with your binoculars or, or not. And there's a common symptom that all birders talk about called warbler neck, which is you know the sore neck you get when you're craning up looking to try and see these guys flitting around. So if you're out looking at warblers, remember, stretch your neck, relax your traps, because to see them, it requires a lot of patience and diligence, but believe me, it is absolutely worth it. Our warblers are a wonderful group of birds that spend a limited time with us. They're a visual delight. They're an oral or sonic delight. And when you think about the energy and the determination it takes to fly the long distances they do to come up here to raise their young on our insect bloom, you even have a greater appreciation for them. If you're interested in learning more about warblers, here's some resources for you. Thewarblerguide.com by Princeton University Press. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology, also in Prince, Princeton, has all about birds. It's a website where you can study and learn and play the bird songs over and over. And of course, Merlin is an app that can help you identify the birds if you're new to birding. The Audubon Guide to North American Birds is also a good book for warblers. And for learning their songs specifically, the app LarkWire, Learning Bird Songs, is a great way to learn about them. You can hone in on the warblers. They have little games that you can play where it will give you a choice between three or four different warbler bird species. And if you get guess correctly, you get a little flapping pair of wings. If you guess incorrectly, a red bird foot comes down and <clears throat> squashes you. So makes it kind of fun. So thank you for listening and enjoying this presentation. Here's an orange crowned warbler singing his thumb down the teeth of a comb song. And you can actually see a little bit of his orange crown. So that's why I included this picture. Thanks for enjoying our visiting warblers. And I hope I've inspired you to maybe go out and appreciate these guys out in the field. Thank you very much. And Joey, I think we can take some questions and answers. Sounds like a great idea, Ed. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. A lot of great information to share there. Um, now it's time for Q&A. You can ask questions by either putting something into the Q&A box, and I'll, uh, I'll pass those on to Ed. You can also raise your hand if you want to ask Ed a question directly. Uh, I want to thank a, a number of people that I see out there in our crowd today. I see Carly. Uh, I see uh, Kim. I see, uh, let's see, uh, Francine Daisy. I see you out there. I'll be calling on you because we got a program coming up, so we'll need your assistance with that. And I also see um, uh, Susan uh, out there, and I hope uh, you come and visit us sometime soon. So thank you all for joining us and let's get to some of those questions. And so the first one is, where do you find yellow-breasted chats? <laughs> yellow-breasted chats like areas that are near water. So uh, 
deciduous thickets that are near a lake or near a river um, are prime chat country. So we get them at uh, the Union Bay Natural Area, also known as the Montlake Fill. Um, the Kent Ponds, I've heard there are, I don't get down there that often, but the Kent Ponds area is a good birding area and there have been chats down in that, in that area as well. Um, if you go east of the mountains, uh, the areas I mentioned before are, are great places to find chats. Um, over in the Metau Valley, Perigen Lake is a great spot for chats. They're very reliable. They breed there regularly. Along the Metau River, any of the uh, river trails that are between Mazam and Winthrop are great spots. Um, in the Leavenworth area, yellow-breasted chats, I, as I mentioned, I heard one last month at uh, the Icicle River Fish Hatchery. Um, there's a set of nice guided trails that walk along the Icicle River. Lots of warblers in there, many different species, Nashvilles, yellows, chats, McGilvery's, um, all kinds of warblers in that area. But for chats, they like, they like wet areas, so they like to have water nearby. So that's a, a good place to, to scope out as a, a lake or a stream that's got some wooded areas around it. And uh, listen for that distinctive uh, mimicking song. It, it, it is quite remarkable. All right, well, thank, thanks Carly for that question. And, and while we're on chat, uh, Doris has a sharp eye and notice that the uh, chat has a bill that looks different from others. Uh, so Doris wants to know, are chats uh, insectivores? Chats are insectivores. Um, some birders, or for a period of time, some birders were kind of reluctant to put the chat in the warbler family because it is larger. It does have a thicker bill than the, the thin insectivorous bills of all the other warblers. And its vocalization is quite unlike the other ones. It's more akin to a gray cat bird or a um, northern mockingbird, which are bird mimics that use a variety of sounds and are constantly mixing up the what syllables and what notes they sing. But um, it is included in the warbler family. The thick bill allows the uh, chat to go after insects that are deeper in crevices and in, in bark of plants. So um, it's a thicker bill that can work its way into bark of shrubs and trees, whereas the other warblers tend to just pick out the insect eggs or the spiders or spider eggs or the little caterpillar larva of many different insects or the adults on the wing, but the chat's thicker bill allows it to be a little more versatile in the foods that it gets. So good observation, the chat is kind of an outlier. It's in its own genus, it's in the genus Ictera, but it is still considered in the warbler family. And because it is so unique with that crazy vocalization, I wanted to make sure I included it. Okay, thank you. So. Um the best time to see warblers? Are this something for the early birds or people who kind of like to be out during dusk? Um, with birding, all of the birds, when they wake up, they do their thing with vocalizations. You know, they're motivated by their hormonal levels to uh, announce their territories to uh, earlier in the spring to call out for females. So it's besides eating and staying, you know, fit, it's the number one priority. So mornings are always the best time for bird songs. Um, many of you are probably aware right now, even our American robins start singing at four in the morning, much to the consternation of many people who have their windows open to let the evening breeze come in. And in the morning, this loud trip, 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 trip wakes them up. So morning is a great time. That being said, Right now, even in the middle of the day, for example, in Seward Park, you can walk along the trails and hear Wilson's warblers. Middle of the day, you can hear black-throated gray warblers. Um, earlier in the season, I was hearing yellow rump warblers any time of the day. So the most bird songs are in the morning, but in May, as we go into early June, these birds are driven to find mates and establish territories, and they'll sing all day long. Now, as we're getting warmer days like we have right now in June, many birds, because bird song is a very highly caloric, high energy expenditure activity, their whole bodies are into it. And when the days get warm during midday, most birds will kind of simmer down with song because they, they want to regulate their body temperature. And because it is so exertional, they'll quiet down during midday. But 
you know, in most days, if we have our temperature staying in the 60s or low, low 70s, you can hear some of these warblers singing all day long. But morning is the best time. But if you can't get out in the morning, you have a job, you can get out at midday, you can still hear them. But not for long. By July, things will start calming down. And by August, you'll hear very, very little in the way of warbler songs. So it's a limited pleasure. Super. So, uh, so Susan, I hope Russ is close by watching with you. Uh, Susan wants to know which warblers are in Sewer Park right now. You kind of touched on that, Ed, but can you elaborate on, you know, what parts of the park and which uh, warblers we might find in Seward right now? Sure. And uh, give Riley, don't forget Riley, their dog. <laughs> Our dog, Lucia, loves Riley. So anyway, if you walk on the main trail, the Skabuxid, or it used to be called the Spine Trail, right through the crest of the park, you can hear black-throated gray warblers on each side of the trail. It's a, it's a, it's a pizza, it's a, it's a, it's a pizza, pizza on each side. Um, I've had a lot of Wilson warbler activity along the Licorice Fern Trail. So there's a lot of a beaked hazelnut growing in that area. And they like that deciduous, deciduous shrub area because those leaves of shrubs like vine maple, uh, beaked hazelnut, even big leaf maple, get a lot of aphids and white flies, a lot of sucking insects. And um, warblers love to just pick those off. So they end up, they kind of like groom the plant. They're picking off aphids, white flies, um, scale insects, any of those kind of homopterids, order homoptera sucking insects, they'll pick them right off of there like a vacuum cleaner. So that's a great spot for the, the Wilson's warblers to hear those guys. And right now, those are the two that are singing most prominently in Seward Park right now. So check out those trails and I, I can almost guarantee you'll hear them. Thanks, Susan. All right, um, so before I go on with the next question, I do wanna remind everyone that uh, probably about an hour after we sign off, you'll be able to watch or share uh, the video of this program, this presentation. Uh, you'll find it at Sewer Park Audubon's YouTube page. It's being recorded and like I said, it's gonna be signed off. Uh, take about an hour, but it'll be ready for people to kind of share and go over some of the fine points and, and remember some of the, 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 the interesting calls that Ed made and how much they sound just like the actual birds do. Um, and, and when you begin to torture yourself on how well Ed's ear is so adept at you know, listening to the birds, please remember Ed spent so many years as a music instructor. He's got a finely tuned uh, set of ears and so it really helps out. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, you, know, you. You mentioned that they start breeding in June and sometimes in May. Is this at the, uh, the southern range of their breeding area? Are some of them going on to um, Alaska, Canada, um, in, into the to the uh, Arctic, or is this kind of where they kind of end up mostly? Mostly, we're kind of in the middle of their migratory range. Many of these warblers continue north up into British Columbia, up into South and Central British Columbia. Some even as Northern British Columbia. Some of them go as far as Oregon, and they that's where they make their home. Some are in California. So with different populations, depending on, as we believe with migration, where, where they were born and raised is the area that they end up going to when they want to uh, breed and have their own young. So we're kind of in the middle of the, the great West Coast warbler range. So you can find them north, you can find them south. We're kind of right in the middle. Us in Northern Oregon, I think, are kind of the center of if you were gonna define Northern and Southern boundaries. And as you said, Joey, you know, we, I presented the 12 warblers that you can find here to be comprehensive, but don't let it be overwhelming to you. Start with just a couple. If you can learn, as I mentioned, the Wilson's warbler and maybe the black-throated gray or the orange crown warbler with the thumb running down the teeth of the comb and a common yellow throat, witchity, witchity, witchity. You know, just get a two or three and then, you know, build on that. Next year, try to learn one or two more. I mean, I didn't learn all of these birds my first year birding by year. I spent many, many seasons with Libby Mills, you know, drawing on her expertise and her knowledge of the, the subtle variations that you can have in these bird songs. So um, 
it's a lot to learn, but I'm happy to share it all with you, but don't feel like you have to swallow all of this information <laughs> in one go. Learn a little bit at a time. And the good news is, is, as I say on all my birding trips, is that you know the latest brain research, much of it done right here at the University of Washington, shows that when you're out looking and listening for birds and you see a bird that you recognize, you get a little shot of endorphins in your brain. You get a little dopamine hit. So the more of these birds you learn, you're getting little natural highs going off in your brain and who doesn't want to feel good? So learning these birds, even if it's a few at a time, is going to make you happier, healthier. And uh, we all want that. All right. So uh, the next question is from Carly and I'm going to read it to you verbatim. Uh, are there any warblers that tend to throw you off, Ed, even with your fantastic skills? <laughs> they sure do. The Townsend's warbler and the black-throated gray warbler can sound very, very similar. They both have kind of a two-part It's a subtle difference. The Townsend's warbler tends to have and then two ascending zit zit. Zeetle, 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 zeet, zeet. Whereas the black throated gray, it's more eats, eats, eats a pizza. So there are some subtle differences, and I've been fooled several times. Um, even if you're not talking in the warbler realm, the American robin, the uh, western tanager, another one of our tropical migrants, and the uh, uh, black headed grosbeak, three birds that all sound very similar. And, you know, even the real experts get fooled sometimes. I remember Libby Mills being fooled, thinking it was one, and we get to finally get it in our view. Oh, it's the other bird instead. So, yeah, I do get fooled. And okay. remember that all bird songs, there's always some variation. In fact, um, it's, it's hypothesized that females will select males partially based on the variety of, of syllables and phrases they can throw into their songs, as well as how robust the song is. Like the stronger DNA manifests itself in a bird that can do a little more variations on the song. So it's almost like they're out there trying to trick you, but there are some basic standard memory aids that I tried to present here. But yeah, I get fooled sometimes. That's all part of the fun. Well, Carly says, thanks for being human. <laughs> so um you know we're, we're doing a lot of bird programs at eight o'clock right now and of course the programs that we're doing are free so definitely you know take this opportunity to sign up for some of those programs and join ed uh we have binoculars if you don't but join ed and we're looking at not just warblers but other uh birds waterfowl raptors and the whole nine yards a lot of bird activity happening in sewer park um, so, Ed, uh, looks like we're done with questions at this point. Is there any final parting words you want to share with anyone before we sign off? Um, yes. It can seem overwhelming. I'm kind of, what I said earlier, when you do a presentation and you try to be comprehensive, here's all these warblers, and they all look somewhat alike, and their sounds are all somewhat similar. Don't, don't be overwhelmed. Just learn a few at a time and add to your vocabulary. It's kind of like learning a new language. Um, learn a, a few words, a few phrases, and then just build and add to that. And after a couple of years, you'll be surprised um, if, you're, if you're really into it, um, how much your, your range of knowledge and identifying these birds can, can expand. And one of the best ways to do it, I've mentioned before, I hung out with Libby Mills, as well as some other really expert bird song people for many years. Go out with someone who really knows. Come to Seward Park and, and join me on our bird walks. And I'll be happy to give lots of repetition and explanations. And that's how you kind of develop your own oral and visual vocabulary for identifying these guys. And again, you're just getting constant endorphin shots as you learn more birds and see them and appreciate them. So it's good for birds to because we end up making decisions that help birds in habitat and it's good for us. So um, enjoy our birds and uh, please come by Seward Park and, and join me for a bird outing. Right now, I guarantee we'll hear some Wilson's warblers and black-throated grays. All right, and with that, we're gonna say good night. Remember, you can find us online at the, at the YouTube page for Sewer Park Audubon Center, and you can find us in the park. You can stop in and ask Ed some questions or join us for one of our uh, wonderful walks led by Ed Dominguez. Ed, thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. And thank you. I'll see you in the park sometime soon. Good night. All right. Good night.